Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this short game to video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with Nintendo Switch and why it is impossible for Nintendo to stop a vulnerability in this system, which will allow hackers to run pretty much at any code that they desire. Then we're going to move over to Intel and Tremont, which will succeed Goldmont Plus, which of course is an Atom Core. Then we'll finish the serious stuff anyway with the latest in the legal minefield, that is technology, with Microsoft being accused of willful patent infringement, and this is related to graphics, lighting, and shadowing methods, before switching to something more fun and light-hearted as NVIDIA have demonstrated AI-driven photo reconstruction. And this thing is pretty darn insane. But, once again, we're going to start things out with Nintendo Switch. Oh, and a small personal note. Yes, I am back from the US right now. I flew in this morning, UK time. I'm operating on around four hours sleep. So, that's fun. But hopefully I'll be able to crash out pretty well tonight. I really enjoyed myself in America. And I will be going back there in a couple of months. But my workflow will be more like normal when I go back. But I'll cover that stuff in a future vlog because I've got some stuff stored up. But anyway, first things first, the Nintendo Switch. So first things first, why can not there be anything done to prevent this from the point of view of Nintendo? Well, we have to go in a bit of history lesson. So first of all, the Switch exploits themselves were discovered by Fail Overflow. However, a lot of this work was based upon the exploits. Get it? You get it? Oh dear of Catherine Temek. Now, she found the vulnerability in the Tegra line of embedded processors. And it says, and I quote, this is a report that she's released publicly. This report documents Fuse Galley, hopefully I'm pronouncing that cor correctly, a cold boot vulnerability that allows full unauthentic unauthenticated, yes, lack of sleep is getting to me, arbitrary code execution from early boot ROM context via Tegra recovery mode RCM on NVIDIA's Tegra line of embedded processors, as this vulnerability allowed arbitrary code execution on the boot and power management processor before any lockouts can take into effect. This vulnerability compromises the entire root of trust for each processor, allowing exfiltration of secrets, example, burned into the device fuses. Now, according to the hackers in question, they have actually disclosed this stuff to Google, but even so, they brought forth the release date a little bit for this particular exploit. It was originally going to be the 25th of April, but now, of course, we're seeing it right now. So, why exactly is Nintendo helpless here? I mean, what steps can they take? Well, first things first... Nintendo and NVIDIA are fully aware of the exploits, but they just can't stop it. The only choice Nintendo have, well they've got two, but one of them's not as particularly going to do much. The first one is they can actually change the Tegra X1 processor. So in other words, they will have to fix the bug on the actual hardware level, obviously with the help of NVIDIA. Now this looks to be the T214 Tegra processor. Just for reference, the standard model it has a Tegra processor known as T210. And this was actually referenced in the Switch 5.0.0 firmware. Oh, and a slight aside, the same firmware also referenced the possibility of the memory of the Switch being bumped up to 8GB. This is um, doubling it over the 4GB of the current vanilla models. The other possibility is Nintendo could do something regarding the actual software, the OS. The problem is, while they can't prevent the OS from being altered physically, they can make it harder to actually re stop reverse engineering of the actual operating system. The problem is, this is like trying to use a bucket to bail the Titanic. Sure, you're going to have some effects, and it will make things a little harder for the water to flow in, but ultimately it will flow in. The bottom line is, and this is using a PC example, but if your BIOS is compromised, patching Windows is not necessarily going to do much. And in this instance, of course, this is a hardware level bug, so it's operating at several le le uh, levels lower than what the operating system or indeed games do. So in reality, if you choose not to update your Nintendo Switch, or even if you do, hackers can simply just run with the times and eventually just figure out what Nintendo did, and pretty much it's just going to be a game of cat and mouse. I also want to make it abundantly clear that the team are not releasing this with the 
potential in their mind that, or rather with the desire in mind, that you will be able to run pirate software. Instead, it's more for fun. Uh, the Tegra boot ROM bug is so obvious that multiple people have independently discovered it by now, and best, a release by other homebrew teams is inevitable, while at worst, a certain piracy mod chip team might make the first move. 90 days ago, we began the responsible disclosure process with Google, as Tegra chips are often used in Android devices. The disclosure deadline has now lapsed, and the bug will, maybe, will be made public sorry, made public likely sooner, so we might as well release now along with the Linux boot chain and kernel tree to make it very clear that we do this for fun and homebrew and nothing else. In other words, they're pretty much just trying to cut off any other competitors, other hackers who would release this with the potential for piracy, in other words, exclusively for piracy in mind, and then also trying to make money off of it simultaneously. I don't really want to get into the piracy side of things with this video because it's not exactly something I want to get slapped by YouTube. However, of course, eventually this stuff is going to become easier if that's your thing. But from the perspective of like me, the idea of being able to run Linux on your Switch or being able to open up the system and do loads of cool stuff, for example, watching movies on it or customize the OS so perhaps you can have Twitter or perhaps Facebook or whatever else is kind of cool. Yes, I'm not saying that you can't get other smartphone tablets other smartphones or tablets, which of course can do the same thing, but hey, it just limits the number of devices that you need to carry with you. Switching to Intel, and the company have recently updated its developer documentation for instruction set extensions. And in doing so, they have revealed a few key things regarding their upcoming processors. First things first, we know that Goldmont Plus now has its successor. It's known as Tremont. And just for sake of clarification, these will be, of course, used for Atom, Celeron, and Pentium Silver branded socks. Unfortunately, specifications have not been disclosed, so we can only guess, but most likely, using some edumacation, i.e. predictors of Intel's past, we can probably say that it's going to be based on 10NM, as Intel typically shies away from their enhanced processors, either plus or plus plus, when it comes to socks for entry level. The number of CPU cores, the clock speed, and that type of jazz has not been confirmed, but given what the instructions are, and we'll go into those briefly in a second, it looks like Intel are going to continue with their previous modus operandi, in other words, go with a wider execution design. So, for example, with Goldmont, we saw the move from a two-way to a three-way. So now, four-way allocation and retirement are definitely more the norm, and don't forget, because most likely we're going to see this on a 10nm process if you actually look at the atom lineup a lot of the more complex design features from their core lineup just haven't made it yet into these particular processes but obviously if you're shrinking the actual manufacturing process it would allow more complex processor designs indeed there are actually a couple of different uh, features which will be making or rather instructions which we're making their way from ice lake these include cl uh, WB, and this allows the writing back of modified cache data to be much more efficient. And we also see the inclusion of CL demote, and what this allows is the CPU to demote a cache line with a specific address to a slower, more distant piece of cache, and it doesn't need to write it back to the memory first. The reason this is so important is because that means that A, you're saving the time to write back to the memory and then, of course, the cache, but also on top of that, it means that it's going to be faster to access from other cores within the same CPU. If you want the TLDR here, it's simple. Intel still wants to put out low-cost processors, which, of course, are going to be used for the normal things like two-in-one laptops or whatever, but while, of course, they can't offer the performance levels of, let's say, the latest Coffee Lake CPU, what they can do is have a feature set which has similar levels of parity. Oh, and speaking of parity, let's talk about lawsuits, because they're always fun. So, Games Industry have reported that Infernal Technologies and Terminal Reality have accused Microsoft of having infringed a couple of patents. And these patents are related to graphical lighting and shadowing methods. I'm going to read out the accusation. Terminal Reality developed a number of video games such as 
Nocturne, Blood Rain, Ghostbusters the video game, Connect Star Wars, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned that one, The Walking Dead, Survival Instinct, probably definitely shouldn't have mentioned that one. Terminal Reality has also developed video game graphics engine called the Infernal Engine, used in many of Terminal Reality's games. In addition to having the Infernal Engine in our own games, Terminal, Real Terminal Reality excuse me, have successfully licensed the Infernal Engine to other video game developers for their use in video games. In, in 2014, Terminal Reality granted Infernal Technology an exclusive license to a number of patents, including asserted patents as defined below and exclusive rights to enforce the same. Infernal Technology and Terminal Reality are collected for referred to herein as the plaintiffs. There are actually a couple of things which really amuse me here because they're listing several titles, some of which, obviously, you can pretty much say, yeah, okay, that's definitely Microsoft. I mean, Halo 5, fine. Multiple Forza games, fine. Sea of Thieves, fine. They are essentially developed by studios and then published by Microsoft or developed by studios Microsoft own and then, of course, published by Microsoft. But there are also a bucket load of games which, well, you can't necessarily say that you'd want to agree with, even if you're adamant Microsoft haters. For example, they are listing Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. They've listed Rise of the Tomb Raider. I mean, sure, Rise of the Tomb Raider did have an exclusive period by... Microsoft, but essentially it was developed by Crystal Dynamics and then published by Square, if memory serves. Dead Rising was, well, developed by Capcom, right? Terminal Reality and Infernal Technologies, meanwhile, argue that Microsoft is intimately familiar with the nature and scope of both the patents in question here, and has been since at least 2005. And the claim itself is supported because Microsoft tried to put forward a patent in 2007 but it was rejected because of the two patents from Terminal Reality. Meanwhile, Electronic Arts have also had a scuffle with these two companies, and back in 2015, there was a lawsuit filed by Terminal Reality and Infernal Technologies against EA, and in 2016, Electronic Arts began a review on this, challenging the pat patentability excuse me, of the claims. And then eventually in 2017, late 2017, EA entered into a formal settlement agreement with uh, Terminal Reality and Infernal Technologies. Some people, of course, are immediately going to say patent trolling and so on. And honestly, I don't know enough about the case to really delve into it as it would require, of course, me to actually be having access to some of the, well, essentially intellectual property on both sides of the aisle here from Microsoft and terminal reality but they're all always 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 these types of lawsuits going on in the games industry unfortunately and one of the reasons behind that is because sometimes just subtle nuances in a technique which oftentimes by the way could be created at pretty much the same time are what makes or breaks a case and just for example look at the sheer number of anti-aliasing techniques that there are don't forget that, for example, Terminal Reality was last seen alive. It was actually defunct back in December of 2013. So it's not really been producing any content for almost four and a half years now. So it's essentially completely and utterly liquidated. And if you try to visit their website, all you get told is the page is okay. Quite literally. I'm curious to know your thoughts on this. Do you feel that these claims have any merits? Or do you think they verge more on the patent trolling type of legal battle where a company is essentially just trying to wrangle money any way they can? Okay, so now on to something very cool from NVIDIA. No, it's not a new GeForce graphics card or anything like that, but for people who are interested in image manipulation or 3D rendering or artificial intelligence and that type of gamut of stuff, this is pretty damn cool. So NVIDIA's AI-driven photo reconstruction technology has been demonstrated in a video and my gosh it looks very impressive. A team of researchers from NVIDIA, uh, led by Guylan Liu, hopefully that's pronounced correctly, have introduced a state-of-the-art deep learning method and this allows you to edit images or reconstruct a corrupted image even if it has missing holes or pixels or whatever else right in the middle of it. 
Now, what type of performance are you using here? Well, NVIDIA are utilizing Tesla V100 GPUs and the CUDNN Accelerated PyTorch Deep Learning Framework. And they've basically trained a neural network by applying the generated masks to images from ImageNet, Place2, and various other websites and sources. I don't want to get into an entire spiel on how deep learning works. I discussed this at length with a recent uh, Neil um, Trevor interview from NVIDIA, by the way. So if you do want to check that out, then feel free to search Neil Trevor on the channel and uh, deep learning will pop up and you can just click that. But essentially, when you're training a neural network, you need a massive data set. And then what you need to do is pretty much teach the neural network as you would a child what's right and what's wrong and when it gets it right you say yep that's a good neural network when it's bad you give it a slap upside the noggin and say no you're not going to get any dessert tonight a lot of folks i'm assuming would be familiar with photoshop and its various retouching tools such as the healing brush and in a way this is very similar it's just that a lot of the manual labor is pretty much taken away and instead the artificial intelligence of the neural network does a lot of the heavy manual lifting for you in fact, the team first generated 55,116 masks with different shapes and sizes and used that for training. I will say that it's not perfect. You can definitely see a few issues here on there with some of the images. The eyes in particular look, look a little off on a couple of the models, but still, it's pretty damn impressive. And you've got to remember, this is not finished technology. This is not technology that they are now selling, you know, uh, for a monthly fee. This is technology that they're still working on and will definitely improve over the next three months, six months, 12 months, you know, 24 months, particularly as the neural network, because that's kind of what they do, gets better at things and it actually becomes more trained and just more refined. And it's, to me at least, very impressive and a great indication of what we could be seeing from visual artists in the future. It's not necessarily the uh, artists won't need to do work per se they probably will need to do some level of manual work but a lot of this stuff will be automated and it's very cool and of course this would eventually find its way into games as well and it would be more that the artist is essentially saying in many instances what they actually want rather than needing to necessarily do all the work by hand which could definitely open up the medium some with all of that said hopefully you've enjoyed the video i'll see you soon take care bye for now